Thank you, everyone, for joining us. My name is Adil Najim. I'm the uh, Dean of the Pardee School of Global Studies uh, and also uh, former director of the Pardee Center uh, and, 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 and currently also looking at it. So let me also in that capacity welcome you again on behalf of the Pardee Center. We are really delighted uh, and, and very thankful uh, to Jim for pulling off this conference uh, despite sort of these, these new modes and, and, and the norms that COVID has imposed on us. We hope to have uh, many of you on campus and in person for the type of conversations that we, we pride ourselves with and which I do think are still very important uh, as I hope things uh, become better. But we are very, very delighted that, that, um, that uh, Jim has been able to do this conference in this mode and attract such a wonderful set of people uh, both yesterday and today. So thank you very much for that. Uh, my job right now is simply to introduce this session and I'm looking forward to it very much for reasons that will also become very, uh, very clear in a minute uh, to welcome uh, Marto Mildenberger who joins us from Santa Barbara and has, is, is up early there uh, and I would urge you to, um, to check out his full CV on, on his website, along with this wonderful outdoor photograph of him looking up uh, towards the future, it seems, from that photograph. So that's a little advertisement to go and actually read all the wonderful things that he has written and, 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 and worked. But uh, my interest, especially in this session, uh, is that he brings to us the politics of, uh, of the topics that we have been talking about. And so we, we've talked a lot about carbon pricing in an economic sense, which is extremely important. And as we've noticed yesterday, uh, that cannot be and must not be um, disentangled from the politics. So today we are going to, uh, in this keynote, uh, hear much more about the politics of carbon pricing and why redistributive arrangements within countries rather than just uh, conflict between them might be the key to building viable climate politics uh, policies. And, and this is important, I think, particularly in the moment we live in. Um, and I talk about the larger global climate change uh, challenge, where sometimes, and let me put my politics on the, on the board, uh, sometimes a lot of us, at least me, uh, thinks that climate delay might now be a much bigger problem than climate uh, denialism. So in a way, we have been focused so much on convincing people uh, of the climate challenge that uh, the clock keep, keeps ticking. And that is why this conference is important. And that is what uh, we're going to hear about in this keynote is extremely important uh, in terms of creating a politics that gets us to, uh, to, to active climate policies and, and actual uh, change hopefully uh, in the system. So let me with that uh, welcome our speaker and it is all to yours. Okay. Well, well, thank you for that uh, lovely introduction. Um, let me just share my screen. Well, great. So it's, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I thought it was a really stimulating conversation yesterday. And what I want to bring to the conversation today is the perspective of a political scientist. Um, I am um, sort of part of a, a small but growing set of political science scholars who spent a lot of time thinking about the political economy of carbon pricing. Um, and I, I guess I want to just touch on four, four different topics that occupy our, our time and sort of research. And I'll, I'll touch on um, some of my recent work in, in unpacking them. And so the first is that I want to think a little bit about the sort of the structure of particularly efforts to pass a carbon tax um, and what the sort of the structural barriers to that are when it comes to generating a, a viable political coalition to enact that carbon tax, right? So we, we heard a lot yesterday about, uh, you know, the absence of political will to sort of pass policies that had the, the level of ambition that economic models suggest is um, appropriate or necessary for sort of efficiently managing the, the climate solution. Um, and I wanna think a little bit about, you know, how should we make sense of that, that concept of the sort of the presence or absence of political will, right? How, how can we make that more operational, more, um, you know, put flesh on those bones to, to understand uh, when and how climate policies get passed? 
Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of my own work explaining cross-national variation in carbon pricing enactment um, and offer sort of a theory to, to help explain differences between countries in this enactment. Um, I'll, I'll pivot and talk a lot about uh, sort of the, uh, how policy design might be a strategy to sort of build political coalitions in support of carbon pricing. Um, I'll focus specifically on uh, rebates and the degree to which revenue recycling um, can be a viable way to sort of reshape political coalitions. And then I, I wanna finish by just talking a little bit about the, the current political state of play when it comes to climate policy. Of course, there's not a, a robust carbon price that's included in sort of the current Americans job plan reconciliation bill. Um, but the, the way that the clean energy standard that has sort of become the centerpiece of the sort of the programs that least power sector decarbonization works, um, I think it's quite interesting from a political economy perspective. Um, and it's worth thinking about sort of the structure and logic of how that works um, relative to uh, previous efforts that we've had in this country to sort of uh, pass a carbon tax. Um, and, and sort of interpret that from sort of this political science lens. So um, that's where I'll be going. Um, oops, let me start um, with uh, thinking a little bit about the political constraints. And of course, as uh, a number of people remarked yesterday, there's very few um, places in the world where when a carbon tax in particular has been proposed, um, at least sort of within sort of uh, democratic contexts where there hasn't been like really serious political distributive conflict um, over sort of that policy, right? So of course, um, you know, famously uh, Australia sort of sets up this, well, that technically they, they set up an emissions trading scheme but it had sort of a fixed price for the first couple of years. So it was treated as a carbon tax um, that led to sort of quite significant backlash um, across of Australia um, and uh, eventually led to sort of the, the uh, a shift in government from the Labour Party back to sort of the, the coalition, the Liberals and Nationals, um, and then the repeal of that policy. Um, but, you know, we, we've seen other types of really serious backlash. A uh, speaker yesterday, several mentioned the, the Gilets Jaunes in France, this sort of, uh, you know, serious backlash that was triggered in part by sort of a climate um, oriented increase in sort of the gasoline tax. Um, and, you know, we, we've seen similar types of mobilization, for instance, in Canada around uh, the current Trudeau government's effort to uh, pass a carbon tax or sort of have a, a pan Canadian policy framework that established a carbon price of some sort um, in every Canadian province. And of course, in the US, you know, we've had. Um, all the way back to sort of the efforts to pass a BTU tax in the early 1990s as part of the, the first Clinton budget led to substantive, um, substantial backlash. Um, you know, the many people who lost their uh, congressional seat during the 1994 wave, you know, still describe themselves as having been BTU'd. Um, so they sort of ascribe the um, you know, the, the losses of Democrats to sort of this effort, failed effort to sort of pass an energy tax. Um, but, you know, even, even uh, more recently, if we look at sort of the failed Waxman-Markey bill, um, you know, uh, Manchin famously ran this political ad when first running for the Senate in 2008, um, where he, he literally shoots a copy of sort of the cap and trade bill um, with his gun as sort of like a, a way of asserting that, you know, a carbon price is not good for West Virginia. And he has similarly made very clear that, um, you know, a carbon tax is not something that will get his vote in the sort of, in the current Senate um, session. Okay. And despite all of that, um, there are places in the world, here's a, you know, a, a metaphorical picture of Norway in 1990 one, two, three, the early years of sort of the Norwegian carbon tax where we don't see this mass mobilization. And, and there have been some carbon taxes that have come into being in some countries, apparently without the type of political conflict that sort of we, we've seen in some of these 
you know, Canadian, Australian, American, French cake. Okay. And so um, in um, my work, I focus what I think is, I focus on what I think is the, the key political challenge that we need to unpack when it comes to passing a sort of a carbon price um, and particularly a carbon tax, right? So, you know, fundamentally, um, we do have carbon prices in a range of different countries, but with a few exceptions, right? Those carbon taxes were enacted are too low. And in most cases, even where they're high, they're too narrow, right? And so to, to sort of deliver on the promise of this policy, uh, we need essentially carbon prices with high rates, broad sectoral coverage, and we now need them over a very compressed time frame. So we're not in a world that we were in in sort of the early 2000s where you could have had a, a very low carbon, very low sort of exemption-free carbon price that's only ratcheted up over time. You know, we're in a world in which you need to very quickly move to pretty high rates across a, you know, a pretty wide uh, part of your society. And, you know, political scientists, when we think about like what makes easy or viable uh, policies, right? We talk about policies that often make the costs more opaque and make the benefits more salient, right? Which is essentially, you know, uh, the, the political recipe for an incumbent government um, having sort of a political or electoral incentive to, to pass a particular policy. Um, and in fact, many challenging policies that have involved a lot of distributive and economic conflict um, if we look at pension reforms, we look at all different types of reforms to the tax system, to the social safety net in this country and other countries, um, political scientists routinely describe and find the ways that, you know, very difficult complex reforms are almost always established in a way that hide the costs or defer the costs to the future, or at least make them extremely opaque, while making the benefits immediate and salient and sort of the the focus of the policy. And that tends to be the sort of the recipe for um, economic reforms that are gonna generate winners and losers, but you need to ensure that the winners sort of are, are sort of the dominant uh, hub of your political coalition and that they're mobilized in support of the policy. Right, but the problem is that carbon taxes um, essentially are the opposite, right? This is a policy that foregrounds by design costs they take this incredibly complex problem of climate change and very elegantly solves it by changing sort of the price structure of goods and services in the economy in a very salient, visible way, right? That's actually, that's the signal that is sort of generating all of the, you know, the intended and beneficial outcomes. But the, the actual sort of benefits to, you know, in terms of a stable climate, um, are very much backgrounded, right? They're not made salient by the policy. And those benefits, of course, as in many climate policies, are going to accrue in, you know, 5, 10, 20, 30 years, often sort of on a time horizon that is outside the political time horizon of an incumbent government that we're asking to pass these policies. Um, and so, political scientists spend a lot of time trying to think about how to navigate this. And so I sort of want to um, talk about this issue in sort of two parts. I first want to think a little bit about sort of cross-national variation carbon pricing enactment. So despite this political logic, despite sort of this political economy, we have seen some countries that sometimes act. And so how can we make sense a little bit of that action? Um, and then I want to think about a few different solutions that um, people have proposed sort of to this fundamental problem. Okay. Um, so here's just some data from, um, I, I think I took this from sort of the, the 2019 or 2020 World Bank, um, you know, state of, state of play in carbon pricing. And, and just to emphasize the extraordinary amounts of variation that exists in sort of the carbon pricing policies that we see across the world. Um, and to emphasize that there aren't very good theoretical explanations for this variation. And there's been very little work in either economics or political science actually making sense of these differences. Um, you know, so we have differences in the timing, right? So we have, you know, Finland with the first serious carbon uh, price in 1990, followed by Norway in 91. Um, we have differences in, in instrument 
choice, whether countries primarily use an ETS or a tax. Um, we have differences in the sectoral coverage, both sort of the percent of national emissions covered by the carbon price, of course, is also more fine grain variation when it comes to which sectors um, are, um, are covered over what time periods. Of course, there's, there's variation in the, the price itself um, that can even vary quite a bit within countries. Um, and, and finally, uh, not even visualized here, you know, there's, um, um, we have variation in what we could call the distribution of costs and benefits. I have a, a cat who's making a brief appearance. Um, so, um, you know, while of course, uh, you know, prices, price structures are going to impact consumers in the long term as sort of the prices of of energy, for instance, changes. There are, there's quite a bit of difference in the way these particular policies are set up in terms of how visible or direct sort of the consumer facing price signals are. So, you know, there's some, some interesting economics work looking at the Scandinavian carbon taxes in the 1990s and just looking at, for instance, what fraction of the sort of immediate costs are producer facing versus consumer facing. Um, and all of sort of the Scandinavian carbon taxes can have like four to one, 10 to one uh, consumer facing costs versus producer costs. So there's a sort of systematic exemptions from um, taxing sort of the, you know, industrial production, um, but, but uh, consumer sources of electricity, uh, heating oil, sort of, you know, gas consumption sort of is sort of taxed in sort of a, an immediate way. And so, we have all this variation and we need to make sense of it. Um, oh, this is, um, and this is actually, this is a bit tricky. Uh, I guess the, this, the animation is not gonna work, but that's fine. I can, I can deal with that. Um, so, so there's a couple of reasons why this is really tricky analytically, right? So one is that we, we lack a consistent measure of policy ambition, right? So, um, if we're trying to explain this variation, um, we can't really, for instance, just use the, the level of carbon tax that exists in a country. Um, and, and you know, this is actually something that's probably not surprising for folks on this call, um, but you know, the, the media also systematically misreports uh, shifts in ambition. So this is just an example of sort of Norwegian uh, you know, Norway doubling its carbon tax in 2014, and it got sort of, you know, this is a Guardian article, but there were, you know, dozens of, you know, global press articles talking about sort of this doubling of the Norwegian carbon tax. Um, that was not the case at all. Um, what had happened was, is that uh, when Norway joined the ETS or linked its domestic carbon pricing scheme with the European scheme, it adjusted its domestic carbon tax level on the offshore sector to ensure that the combined price of its domestic tax and sort of the, the ETS burden um, was equivalent to the previous tax level, right? So here the red is the tax and the blue is the ETS. Um, and then of course, when the, the European carbon price collapsed, suddenly in sort of, you know, 2005, um, offshore oil companies in Norway were facing a carbon price burden it was actually substantially lower than uh, their historic prices, right? Um, and so in the early 2020, about 2012 or 2013, the Norwegian government decided to adjust its carbon tax rate um, back up so that the combined ETS carbon tax price sort of matched the historic carbon tax levels. And that piece of legislation even had explicit provisions that if the European ETS price began to recover, you know, that the carbon tax level would be adjusted appropriately. So there's all of these contexts in which it's actually very difficult to even measure and conceptualize sort of the, what, what is policy ambition in a case like this? Um, we also have lacked consistent empirical strategies to identify the causal effects of policies on emissions, right? So it's very difficult to sort of identify what policies are ambitious and what are not. Um, you know, I've done some work um, sort of using, you know, synthetic control methods. And I know uh, there's sort of a team, Michael Aiklin and, and Patrick Beyer that have, have an interesting paper that also uses this to evaluate the um, EU ETS. And so there are, you know, some, some context in which we can do interesting sort of causally identified post hoc evaluations of the effect of a, a national scheme. 
um, though much of the econometric work tends to be on a sectoral basis. Um, and of course, even today, you know, most, uh, most evaluations, impact evaluations of particular carbon prices um, you know, tend to involve modeled uh, comparisons against business as usual scenarios. Um, and we don't have really a consistent global data set that's thinking about the relative ambition and efficacy of these policies. And even worse, you know, we, there are all of these policies that have been proposed in political systems at all times, right, that didn't pass. And we have no way of retrospectively figuring out what the, the counterfactual ambition of those policies would have been. So this is a long way of saying this is a very difficult empirical setting. I think it's one of the reasons we don't have good work exploring sort of the timing and, and variation of policy ambition. Um, and in this particular part of my research, um, it's a sort of a topic that's required qualitative scholarship. And, um, you know, I've done a bunch of work doing, you know, you know, well over 100 long interviews with senior policymakers and industrial officials in Norway and Australia and um, the United States to try and unpack the political dynamics of conflict. So that's sort of the, the topic of this recent MIT press book that I have that sort of seeks to, to explain this variation. And the, I guess my, my explanation for sort of this, for the sort of political conflict over carbon pricing has sort of two parts. So one is sort of a pattern of political conflict that in the book I unpack is double representation. And the, the general idea here is that, you know, climate change emerges as a, a political issue in the early, you know, late 80s, early 90s, right? But it, it, it comes into uh, being as an object of political conflict in a system that already has sort of fairly mature economic and political cleavages. But sort of the threat of climate change and particularly threat of climate policy sort of exposes these latent differences, right? In the material interests of otherwise similar economic actor and in particular, it splits pre-existing coalitions of capital and labor in the political system, right? Where we have capital that's in carbon intensive industries and capital that is sort of less exposed to, you know, increases in prices associated, for instance, with the carbon tax. And similarly, you know, have workers who, whose jobs are, um, you know, dependent on carbon intensive industry. And we have workers in the clean energy or the service sector who don't face that, that exposure. And so this generates from a political economy perspective, what I call a double representation, which is essentially that no matter whether we have a right or left leaning political coalition in power, right? There are opponents or individuals who sort of are economic losers in a carbon pricing world um, that are embedded in and have voice within incumbent governing political coalitions. Um, and so, you know, we, we, we can think of sort of climate change and carbon pricing as, as having um, become a bit of a left-right issue, but that is very much something that's happened in the United States in the last five to 10 years. That is not sort of the right way of thinking in a global perspective about the types of political conflict that have existed around climate policymaking. Now, this um, distribution of material interests sort of sets the stage for debates over carbon taxes and ETS systems in different parts of the, the world. And to sort of then make sense of how we get variation across countries, you know, in my work, I, I think quite a bit about the institutions that exist, right? So different countries have different economic and policymaking institutions that sort of interact with this distribution of interest in different ways. And then when we put those two things together, we can actually go, um, we can get quite close to a pretty robust theory to explain, you know, why did Norway pass a carbon tax with little controversy in 1991, whereas you know, the US has been unable to do that all the way to, to the present. Um, and so let me just give you a few empirical examples of this work um, and then I'll, I'll sort of leave it to the Q&A and, and, and talk more about it um, with any of you offline. Um, here's just, by the way, um, I, I, I drew this out of a, sort of some archival documents I was looking at. You know, the, there was a coalition of uh, representatives in the early 90s that organized against carbon taxation when Gore and Clinton were considering it as a revenue um, uh, pay for in, in their sort of deficit reduction package. Um, and just to highlight here, Republican districts are in, in black and the, the Democratic districts are in sort of light gray. 
that at the time, sort of this, this opposition to carbon taxation was a very much a bipartisan um, uh, issue that mapped you know, loosely onto sort of the distribution of fossil fuel deposits and particularly coal deposits in the country. Um, but even if we look at sort of uh, Senate emissions trading debates in sort of 2007, eight, um, you know, there, were, there was a very significant 10 or 12 uh, contingent group of Democrats who were quite opposed to acting uh, on a carbon tax and a carbon price. And what we've actually seen in the last 10 years is that many of the Republicans um, Johnny Isaacson, John McCain, who are open to carbon pricing, have lost their seats to now more firmly pro-climate policy Democrats. And many of the Republicans, uh, so many of the Democrats that were opposed, you know, folks like Mark Pryor and Mary Landrieu, um, lost their seats to now fairly anti-climate policy Republicans. And so the distribution of seats in favor or opposed to carbon pricing in the Senate has actually been quite constant, but there's been sort of a shift where um, parties have sorted more cleanly into sort of the two poles of this. Okay, uh, let me come back to this question of Norway um, as an example of a place that passes a carbon tax at a very early stage with very little political controversy. And in my book, I unpack this at length. And the, the key thing to understand is that um, this tax passes without any controversy because it's, gener it, it's designed in a way to not pose an existential threat to any of the domestic industries that can't afford to pay it. And any time over the course of the 90s in which coalitions attempted to, um, to increase that carbon tax, to sort of expand its sectoral coverage to industries that had been exempted, um, we see sort of very immediate and um, uh, backlash. So if we look at sort of this period in sort of the, the mid 1990s, starting in 95, going to 2000 or so, um, there were a series of different efforts to expand the policy coverage and particularly to remove exemptions that existed for all onshore industry. So the initial tax essentially covered offshore oil extraction and domestic uh, you know, household level fossil fuel consumption, but it exempted all sort of onshore industry, all of these, you know, cement and fertilizer and process industries all along the Norwegian coastline. And uh, there's a lot of pressure um, in sort of the minority political coalition context in Norway to try and remove these exemptions to align the tax more with the, what economists felt was sort of the efficient and appropriate economy-wide tax structure. Um, and, uh, and sort of I'll make this policy more similar in practice to what e economists in, in the country and globally wanted the policy to be in theory. So of course the, the uh, prime minister at the time is Gro Harlem Brundtland, right? Of course, um, uh, associated with the eponymous sort of Brundtland commission has been sort of an active voice in thinking about global climate equity in the last you know, um, several decades. Um, but as prime minister at the time, you know, she intervenes to block all efforts to, um, uh, so that, you know, there's a, what we call a green tax commission, a consensual body set up of bureaucrats and, and economists who are seeking to push forward and remove these exemptions and align the tax structure with what economists are suggesting is appropriate. And Brundtland and her government, um, you know, intervene to, um, you know, change the report language, they manipulate the timing of the release so that it doesn't interfere with gas cons plant construction, and they shelve it entirely. Um, eventually, a centrist government um, led by uh, Bondovic, it's actually a, a centrist Christian democratic government, is elected. Um, they attempt to implement these recommendations and to sort of expand the scope of the carbon tax to cover all industries in Norway. Um, and they're actually foiled from a, a coalition on both the right, the conservative party, the left, the labor party, in combination with sort of the labor unions and in, uh, industry associations. So the left and the right sort of get together uh, and sort of block a centrist proposal to, um, you know, to, to rationalize or make more, make this policy more um, aligned with what economists suggest. Um, this government actually in 99 becomes the first government anywhere in the world to lose power as a result of climate change. Again, when the left and the right come together to sort of block their, their climate policy making efforts. 
And so, um, you know, in, in the book, I sort of talk about that there are different pathways to carbon pricing design that ends up being quite um, important when we think about sort of explaining variation in the timing and content of these policies. Um, and a lot has to do with whether carbon intensive actors have sort of guaranteed access to policy design venues. So what we see in Norway is that the policy making institutions exist that allow, for instance, the oil industry, the industrial industry, the, the, the incredibly carbon intensive actors to have a seat inside the room when policies are getting passed. As a result, they can sort of veto existentially threatening costs inside the room. And therefore they have no need to mobilize political conflict uh, in the public sphere. So we have policies like the Norwegian carbon tax in 1991 that are proposed that don't pose a threat to incumbent industries. And therefore there's no political incentive to mobilize conflict in the public domain and sort of rile the public up, right? Where, and so policies then pass at a very early point in time without any uh, political controversy. So we have you know, these producer carrots, consumer sticks, no one is incentivized to make it an object of electoral conflict and we have this earlier action. But anytime we begin to veer towards more significant producer costs, you know, we essentially move into this pathway B, which is the pathway we see in the United States, where um, the policies are threatening economic actors with existential costs. Therefore, they're going to mo mobilize, expand the scope to the public, um, make those consumer costs salient, and you often have delayed action because many policies that are proposed fail. Okay, I can talk a little bit more about this, but I, in, in light of the fact that in these places around the world where sort of political conflict over carbon pricing happens, a big aspect of that conflict ends up being sort of the the mobilization around consumer costs, making consumer costs really salient. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about revenue recycling because this has become a very popular political strategy um, in both the economic theory and in some political science quarters in, in making sense of you know, how can we sell sort of a, the economically efficient carbon taxing policy, for instance, to the public, right? And if the fundamental problem here is that the costs are salient in the short term, but the benefits are opaque in the long term, right? Can we use climate rebates or climate dividends as a way to sort of provide short-term salient climate um, rebates? And, and in at least survey experiments, this has done a lot of hypothetical promise. And I know actually I'm working with uh, Mark Paul on a project and he's gonna present some actually more optimistic uh, perspectives of work that we're doing together in a context in which climate rebates may be working. Um, some of the work that I've done, unfortunately, recently has been less pessimistic or more, more pessimistic. So you'll see both sides of my research agenda here. Um, but I, I wanted to understand a little bit more like how, um, how effective are these policies? Um, and there's two countries in the world that have these rebates. So one is Canada, one is Switzerland. Um, in Canada, five provinces in the country now have tax and rebate schemes starting uh, in 2019. Um, and in the Switzerland, there's been sort of a, a tax and rebate scheme that's existed for about a decade now. Um, in both countries, um, there, there's fairly low policy knowledge um, about the scheme, and that's allowed us to do some interesting stuff in this work. But let me, um, let me show you data from two different uh, recent efforts. So one is a, an effort to do a five-wave opinion panel that was before, during, and after the implementation of the climate rebate scheme the allowed us to lo longitudinally assess at the individual level how people were responding to sort of the receipt of the government rebates and the implementation of a carbon tax um, and then a cross-sectional survey in Switzerland. So here's sort of the, the top lines. This is support over time in Canada. Um, I've broken it, the data in two ways. Um, so one is I've broken it down by uh, partisanship. So the liberals, um, are the incumbent center-left government and liberal party supporters are essentially supporters of the incumbent party that passed this policy. The conservatives, of course, are the center-right opposition party in Canada that has strenuously opposed these policies. Um, and I've broken it down by um, in two bundles. So we have the provinces of Quebec and British Columbia. That's sort of the, um, the yellow and green um, these are provinces that do not have a carbon tax and rebate scheme. 
And then we have the provinces of Saskatchewan and Ontario that are provinces that do have this tax and rebate scheme. Um, the uh, first dotted vertical line is when the policy, the tax came into effect. The solid line between wave two and wave three is when the first rebate was delivered to Canadians. And the dashed, uh, you know, the, the longer dashed line uh, right before wave four was a federal election in which this policy was sort of a serious object of political conflict. Right? So the, the sort of takeaway here is that in our data where we're tracking these individuals attitudes through time, we're not seeing real evidence of an increase in support for the policy in places that were receiving sort of this rebate check, uh, which is of course the assumption underlying um, you know, this idea that we can use these rebates and dividends to increase political coalitional support. Um, and the same is true, even if we look at cost exposure, if we look at people who are more exposed to the tax, you know, we're seeing a very similar um, sort of uh, absence of clear effect of the rebate. Now, when we sort of gauge people's policy knowledge, we see that the public very much doesn't understand this policy, even after they've received their first rebate. Um, people systematically underestimate the amount of their rebate, right? So the, the average uh, respondent in Saskatchewan in our survey uh, believes their rebate is about $268. In, in, the fact, in fact, their average is 434. So we're able to count, we, we can know both the actual rebate that each individual in our survey receives based on sort of the data we collect about their tax structure, as well as sort of their perception of what rebates they receive. And you know, this, this knowledge in Switzerland is also persisting in a low way. Um, here are sort of four different sort of uh, beliefs about uh, the sort of country's climate rebate program. Um, in each case, the green uh, histogram uh, bar is the correct answer. And we can see that, you know, in most of these knowledge questions, um, you know, the, our Swiss respondents don't understand sort of the nature of this benefit and how sort of it, it works. So um, in both of these efforts, we, we ran some survey experiments. Um, for instance, in the Canadian survey in wave four, we prepared these custom tax, reform, tax forms for every single respondent and randomly assigned them to receive sort of a, a filled out tax form that sort of uh, visualizes and explains exactly why they received the rebate they did. And similarly, you know, we have these uh, Swiss uh, rebate forms that sort of give people some exposure to their own uh, benefits. In fact, we asked the Swiss people in our survey to leave the computer, go retrieve their, um, from their paperwork, the form that alerts them to the sort of the size of their rebate. And, you know, well over half of the people that we encourage to, um, to go sort of look up their dividend treatment uh, actually did so. Um, but, but here, you know, the, Again, the, the findings are a little sobering in the sense that um, providing people with this information about the amount of their climate rebate in Canada um, did not change their support for carbon pricing policy. So even when we made the, the benefit extremely visible, extremely salient, it did not shift people's preferences. In fact, it had a potentially deleterious effect particularly on the right. Um, and so what we see here is we see a very si a significant difference, significant reduction in belief amongst right-wing Canadian, uh, the right-wing part of the Canadian public, that the policy was fair when this information was provided. Essentially, people, when they discovered that in fact they were receiving a $450 rebate, um, believed that that was an unfair rebate and that sort of they were losing money even when this is a highly progressive policy, right? So, you know, to think about this, we need to think about the fact that opponents of the policy in Canada, for instance, in Ontario, right, have done things like um, put federal carbon tax stickers explaining the costs associated with the carbon tax on every gas pump in the province, thus inflating the public's understanding of the costs. And so e even if people are in fact, you know, 80, 85% of the Canadian public is progressively receiving more money in their rebate than they're paying in the tax. Those costs have been made salient by opponents and people have this inflated understanding of their costs. They believe you know, they're paying thousands of dollars a year on a carbon tax when they're paying 400 and therefore their $600 rebate is actually seems like a, rather than being a, a material benefit, it's being constructed as sort of a problem. We see similar things in Switzerland. Um, 
where, uh, you know, the um, getting this information about your rebates increases support slightly for the existing policy, but doesn't increase, doesn't create any buy-in for increased uh, shifts in the carbon tax rate. And that's consistent with what we saw, you know, last month where Swiss voters rejected a key, you know, carbon referendum. This, this was a referendum that would have increased the carbon tax and rebate scheme to increase the carbon tax rate along with the, the accompanying rebates. Um, and it was rejected by sort of a majority of Swiss voters. Okay, so um, I, I don't wanna to go too long. So in the, the last just two or three minutes that I have, I wanna quickly contrast some of this material with the state of play that exists right now in DC. Um, and, I, and I wanna contrast it in particular with this clean energy payment program uh, or the clean energy standard is sort of uh, you'll, you'll see it and sort of describe both ways. Um, and the, you know, the dominant power sector decarbonization play right now is essentially an incentive-based clean energy standard that's being designed to be a budgetary and therefore uh, consistent with the reconciliation process. It's a policy that essentially will give uh, payments to load serving entities um, if they meet certain benchmarks in terms of marginal increases in clean energy um, provision into the system, right? And so the thing about this is essentially, you know, we, we talked yesterday about how, for instance, um, power sector decarbonization, right, risked um, or, or, or typically would impose the cost on ratepayers, right? So a typical clean energy standard or RPS, right, is going to sort of um, pass on its cost to ratepayers. This system essentially by having the federal government paying for or investing in sort of this transition, essentially shielding ratepayers from those costs, right? In other words, it's, it's removing the um, salience, the short-term salience of these consumer costs and the ability of opponents to make electricity prices an object of political conflict and also sort of allow sort of a focus on non-climate short-term public benefits like air pollution reduction and jobs. Um, and then this will interact, of course, with sort of, uh, you know, transformations of the renewable energy tax credit system, including making them direct pay so that they, um, you know, that utilities will have a, a larger incentive to, to use them, even they if they have reduced tax burden. There'll be sort of electrification subsidies and similar transportation and building sector um, investment programs. But the, the contrast here is that it's doing many of the same things that a carbon tax in the power sector would do but it's doing it in a way that is sort of uh, sidestepping these really serious and messy distributive conflict um, issues. Now, there's open debates about whether this is a, a, a less efficient from an economics perspective approach to power sector decarbonization. Um, but my general view is that carbon taxes are so difficult to pass in the short term that they probably are gonna be the way that we can most efficiently get rid of the mop up the last 20, 30% of the carbon pollution in our, our system. Um, but less economically efficient policies may actually lead to long-term, like short-term inefficient policies may actually be the key to long-term efficient policies, right? Because we actually first need to sort of disrupt the political power of entrenched interests. We first need to sort of reshape the, the power that different political actors in our system have. And sometimes short-term economically inefficient policies can be the way to disrupt that power to sort of create the political context necessary to sort of pass more longer term efficient policies. Um, and the other thing I'll just say is that, you know, in some ways reconciliation um, is also helpful because one of the, the things that grinds carbon pricing policy discussions to a halt in the US, for instance, the Waxman Markey bill has been, you know, that you have a distributive bargain in the house. This is what happened when the Waxman Markey bill passed. And then opponents immediately mobilize against that bargain um, to try and undermine any efforts to act in the Senate uh, while environmentalists and sort of pro-business, pro-climate actors aren't immediately sort of digging in to sort of defend and advocate for the House bill, because of course um, they would still like to see changes made in a green or brown direction in the Senate. And so you sort of, when you have this two-stage negotiating project where you have a distributive compromise in the House, 
but then you have to renegotiate a new compromise in sort of the second house of Congress. No one is going to sort of, there's no constituency who's going to sort of mobilize to defend that house compromise during this period in which opponents are gonna mobilize against it. And so the sort of reconciliation framework and the budgetary framework also forces simultaneous distributive negotiations at both the, the Senate and House level in the US. And that's actually sort of very helpful in, in generating compromise. Okay, I wanna leave it there, but you know, I think the, the takeaways here is that you know, when we're thinking about the economically optimum policy, um, we need to also have a really clear sense of what our strategy is to generate a political coalition that can sort of pass a particular carbon pricing policy. Um, and, you know, I, um, I think that there's real reasons to be very sanguine about what those political circumstances look like. And any time that we're thinking about the sort of the economic optimality or the economic structure of different carbon pricing policies or climate policies, I think they absolutely need to be coupled with a much deeper and richer understanding of the, the policy political economy and what the political strategy is to generate a coalition that will pass and protect uh, those policies through time. Um, and I think on that front, you know, carbon pricing has really struggled over the last 20 years and it, it continues to be um, a extremely politically difficult uh, challenge and one that uh, climate rebates or climate dividends may not be um, sort of a, an easy sort of band-aid for. So let me leave it there. Thank you very much for, uh, for this and raising a lot of important points and reminding us both of why this is difficult, but also why this is important. So thank you, Professor Mildenberger, for setting us Thanks. off for the Thanks day. So Please join me, everyone, in thanking our speaker, 